If you are anywhere close to the level of nerd that I am, you've probably stood on the line of a roller coaster, stared at a heartline roll, and thought, why does it look like that? The track snakes around and forms a mid-air spiral that seems to mimic the shape of a wine opener. Why doesn't the track just rotate around itself? If you never had that thought, I am sorry for introducing it to your head, but yes, modern roller coaster track doesn't rotate around itself, and the reason for that is heartlining. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you don't mind, please give this video a like, uh, comment if you want, and if you like my other videos, why not subscribe to the channel? It really helps a small content creator like myself against the YouTube algorithm. The structure and setup of YouTube makes it really difficult for smaller channels such as mine to succeed, so any bit of help that you can give will be extremely appreciated. Thanks, and enjoy the video. Heartlining and banking and all of this complicated twisty-turny stuff arises from a simple problem. Continuous circuit rides need turns. If you're designing a full circuit roller coaster, you can't just draw a straight line and get back to the station. Of course, there are plenty of shuttles made with the express purpose of staying in a straight line, but that's not what we're talking about here. In the simplest full circuit layout, commonly called the out and back layout, the train leaves the station, goes up the hill, heads outwards, turns around, heads back to the station, and turns around again. Easy enough. But now we have to traverse the turnaround, and this is where we are introduced to the problem of lateral g-forces. You know the feeling. When you take a turn a little too quickly in your car and you feel yourself slipping out of the seat and all the stuff in your trunk tumbling to the side, that feeling. If a coaster train takes a turn completely flat, the train will be yanked to the left or right, and due to inertia, the riders' bodies will get tossed around like ragdolls. In some cases, like a lot of old wooden coasters, this may be a desirable effect, but if you're designing a looping coaster with an over-the-shoulder restraint that lines up with riders' heads, the riders will suffer a lot of headbanging. Even with lap bars, if you take a turn too quickly and the lateral Gs exceed about 1G in either direction, the sensation will be extremely uncomfortable for everyone involved. To rectify this, ride designers have come up with banking. And banking is just when roller coaster track leans over in a certain direction. This is done to reduce the amount of lateral G-forces experienced by riders, redirecting that lateral force generated by centripetal acceleration and changing it into positive G-forces. Uh, for example, for ease of math, let's just say a train is experiencing 1G of laterals through an unbanked turn. The resultant force on the riders is a combination of those laterals acting sideways and gravity acting down. You can't forget about our good friend gravity. Add the two together and the net force vector is at 45 degrees. So to completely eliminate lateral motion, we just tilt our track 45 degrees and bam, no net lateral forces. If we do the math right and properly bank each of the turns throughout the ride, we should be able to eliminate headbanging almost entirely. But that leaves us with one final problem. How do we transition into the banking? We need to design our track to smoothly flow from one angle to another, but unlike our nice and easy lateral force calculation, this is tougher than it initially appears. If you've ridden an old looping coaster, like for example an arrow looper, you know that the turns aren't the problem. The suspect transitions between elements are where the headbanging really happens. And this is why ride engineers came up with heartlining. Barring a few notable exceptions, you are almost never sitting directly in the middle of a piece of coaster track. Usually you are a few feet above the track, or in the case of an inverted coaster, under the track. Therefore, the center of your body in the coaster train, let's call it a line which runs through about the center of your heart, is far from the middle of the rails. Why does that matter though? Why don't we just tilt the rails and get along with it? Well, if you do that, shit gets wacky. Let's look at this simplified diagram where we have the track and we have the rider's center of gravity marked off with a red X. Now let's see what happens when we rotate the track around itself. Wow. That is a lot of movement and a lot of force. If we were to rotate around the rails for 360 degrees, like in this example, we get what is called an inline twist. And this is an element that could be found in SLCs, the Vacoma Flying Dutchman, at least the one Flying Dutchman left with an inline twist, Skyrocket 2s, and more. But it's not as common as the similar Heartline roll, and that is for a simple reason. It is far more forceful. 
If you ever experience an inline twist, you know what I mean. It feels like you're getting flung out of the train as you rotate violently, feet away from the center line. The centripetal force acting on your body can be approximated using this simple centripetal acceleration formula, F equals mv squared over r. So as we fling around the center line, we're feeling a bevy of strong positive and lateral forces until your body is at the center or r equals zero. Then your body is the center line, so those centripetal forces basically disappear. Now, as this example shows, there are occasions where such a display of force might be desirable, but what if we're just trying to enter into a turn? A sudden jolt of laterals and force coming from a smooth turn is definitely not what we're going for here. So how do we ensure that this transition is seamless and comfortable? For decades, this was a problem that was almost impossible to solve. Early steel and wooden coaster manufacturers lacked the tools to design coaster layouts with electronic assistance and precisely machine pre-built track pieces. No, in these days, everything, from the design itself to the construction of the ride, had to be done by hand. Track had to be hand-bent using bending machines, and everything was welded together on site. Now, this obviously limited the ability of engineers to develop banking offset. Thankfully, there was a manufacturing technique which made coaster building much easier, but also had the nice side effect of moving riders close to the rails. This is known as the low rail banking method. The low rail banking method is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of banking off the center spline, you pick one of the guide rails, which happens to be the low rail on arrow coasters, and bank around that rail. The lower rail stays static while the rest of the track rotates around it. With this method, only one rail has to change in height, which makes building the track a lot easier. But as you can see, it also keeps the heart line far closer to the track. This is a significant improvement in rider displacement. The trains travel less distance, which means transitions can be smaller and more rapid. But does the low rail method solve the force problem? No. In fact, it actually makes it worse. Let's return to our centripetal force equation, mv squared over r. The r is in the denominator, which means there is an inverse relationship between the radius and the force. So the closer you get to the center, the more dramatic the whip is. So while low rail transitions are smaller and can be quicker, they can actually be jerkier. Behold the birth of the arrow transition. Then in the 70s and 80s, something important happened. Computers began to arrive on the scene. With computer-aided design, engineers can now precisely design and prefabricate roller coaster track to exacting tolerances. Everything can be built to the exact spec beforehand and then shipped out to the park to assemble like Legos. No more hand bending, no more low rail method. Now we can implement full heart lining. With the limitless potential of computer design, transitions can flow around the riders and not the track. You can see what happens in the animation here. The track displaces a significantly larger amount than any of the previous methods, but the center of gravity for the rider stays perfectly in the middle. All this to coddle the rider and prevent them from experiencing any of the unwanted forces that were the hallmarks of earlier transitions. This track displacement is most dramatic in elements such as modern heartline rolls, where the track literally rises and falls by feet to ensure that the rider is quite literally at the center of the element. And when done correctly, heartlining eliminates lateral jolts. Ride a smooth, computer-designed B&M with over-the-shoulder restraints, and it's hard not to notice that even decades after original manufacturing, there's almost no lateral jolting through the many transitions. And we have heartlining to thank for that. As we continue to build taller, faster, and more complex rides, computer technology and prefabricated track will ensure that the monster machines of the future will be fully heartlined and remain glass smooth. If you like that sort of thing, of course. So now if you ever see a funky looking JoJo roll, you know why it's designed like that. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you stayed this long, I do have a quick appeal to make. It's been a blast making videos for these past few months, and I really appreciate all the kind words and comments I've received on every single video. They make all the hard work worth it. And that said, as a small content creator, I have had a lot of difficulty getting my videos to reach a wider audience. This isn't something I care about in principle, but I somewhat underestimated the amount of effort that making these sorts of videos involves. And if you don't know anything about YouTube's payment scheme, YouTube doesn't pay small, temp small content creators at all until they hit certain channel milestones. To date, I've not received a single cent from any of the videos I've posted, 
and I've put hundreds of hours into this channel by now. Unfortunately, I'm a graduate student with a lot on my plate already, and I just can't keep producing content at the level I am right now in the future just to drown into the YouTube algorithm. If things stay the way they are, I'm going to have to cut back a lot. So if you enjoyed my videos so far, it would mean the world to me if you can help my content in any way that you can. This could be as simple as leaving a like or a comment. Maybe there's a video of mine from before you enjoyed. Give it another watch and share it with your friends. And of course, if you haven't already, please subscribe. The subscriber number controls my ability to monetize these videos, so I hope you can get to that magic 1,000 number so this crazy idea to rant about coasters on YouTube can hopefully start to make the tiniest amount of sense. That said, I am grateful for all the incredible support and interactions I've had with all of you so far. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, and with your help, I hope I can continue to build this channel to where I want it to be. Route 401 is going around and around and around and around and around and look out at the corner of 12th and Main because I'm going to be sick. Whoop. Okay, Mr. Sun, give me what you got. Ah!